So, do you remember all the fuss about Hamilton? That musical that nobody had seen but everybody was talking about? The musical was unusual because of its rap and hip-hop score, and for its casting of black and Hispanic actors into white roles. Now, my first reaction was, surely, using black music and casting black actors as the people who built the country off their enslavement seems... Yeah? But the show was immensely popular. Nobody else seemed to have noticed a problem. The only references I could find to race were people praising the musical for its colourblind casting and for how the modern score appealed to the youths of today. It made America cool again. And I couldn't understand how anyone who knew anything about anything didn't see some issues with this concept. Unlike Hamilton, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a show I could actually afford to watch, and I have fairly extensively up until about halfway through season six. I really like this show, but again, it kind of broke my brain in the same way Hamilton did. And again, I couldn't find a whole lot of discussion on the subject. The show seems pretty universally and uncritically loved. But earlier this month, fellow YouTuber Corvide, jumping off a tweet by Casey Explosion, mentioned some of the same things that I'd been thinking about Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and suggested that somebody do a video on it. It'd probably be an unpopular video that would attract a lot of hate, so um... I did it, obviously. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a light-hearted workplace comedy set in a police precinct. It centres around talented idiot detective Jake Peralta, the rule-abiding openly gay captain Raymond Holt, and the rest of the team. It follows their various career-related dramas, personal relationships, and all-round hijinks, with a moral focus on camaraderie and friendship. With a racially diverse cast and a clear progressive stance on most social matters, the show has drawn a lot of praise, in particular for its treatment of LGBT issues. Now, Casually incorporating diversity and progressive politics without that being the whole focus of the show is fantastic. It has this very kind of subtle, understated power that I would like to see exercised more often. But in order to approach a story with that level of neutrality, you need a relatively neutral setting. So... Police precinct? Unless you've been living under a rock lately, you might have some idea of why that doesn't make any sense. The US police force has two main sources of origin. In non-slaveholding states, the police force was established to control a dangerous underclass, broadly meaning black people, poor people, and immigrants. In slaveholding states, the police force emerged directly out of the slave patrols established during the 1700s. Across the board, police forces have been built upon racism and white supremacy, leading to the fundamentally violent, discriminatory and unjust police force of the modern day. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is therefore a juxtaposition of two thoroughly incompatible concepts, and we'll come back to that later. But for now, let's focus on some of the features of the modern police force that the show plays straight. Part 1. Degeneracy Sex workers are among one of the worst treated groups by police. On top of the multitude of problems caused by the criminalisation of the practice, police are allowed to arrest suspects on grounds such as suggestive clothing and transgender appearance. Policing of sex work disproportionately affects people of colour, poor people and people who are LGBT. It's a big deal, and you'd think that a progressive show in this setting would cover it. But... Brooklyn Nine-Nine's stance on sex work consists entirely of a few gags about STIs. It's an unironic depiction of police and society as a whole's attitude towards sex work, and reflective of those same attitudes towards sexual deviance in general. In several episodes, Jake refers to his dishonest, cheating father as a slut. Insults are warranted, the guy is shown to be an asshole. However, the choice of insult is interesting, as the word describes promiscuity, not cheating, implying that it's the former rather than the latter which Jake is disgusted by. But we're calling men sluts now, so equal rights? The slut shaming continues when Jake meets his half-sister, Kate, for the first time. While she's staying with Jake and Amy, she fucks a street performer in their living room. Jake and Amy are horrified. But the issue of bringing a complete stranger back to somebody else's house isn't mentioned, and nor are any concerns about Kate's safety when it's implied that she didn't use protection. Jake and Amy's horror seems to stem from a moral judgement towards the sexual activity itself. 
Casual hookups are obviously not inherently bad, but it's also worth noting that consensual non-monogamy is incredibly common within the queer community. The disdain towards deviant sexual activity in this show is part of a patriarchal narrative used to oppress women, sex workers, and queer people alike. Through this, the show paints a subtly negative picture of degeneracy, despite, and even through, its inclusion of queer characters. Raymond Holt, our main gay rep for most of the series, is stereotypically masculine, married, and captain of a police force. He has a nice house, dinner parties, and a corgi. Other than his choice of partner, he is the image of heteronormative respectability. Of course, there are gay people like this, and you might argue that Holt not being a flamboyant gay stereotype is a good thing. But it's worth noting when a show's only gay rep conforms to heteronormative standards that the show is otherwise drowning in. Seriously, there are so many weddings. Wedding. Wedding planning. Failed wedding. Proposal. Wedding planning. Failed wedding. Wedding. Oh my god, what is this image? Fuck, this is cursed. Although Holt's husband Kevin is brought into the show and their relationship is explored, their romantic interactions are literally never shown. The most they do is hold hands in one episode. Public restraint fits their uptight characters, sure, but this doesn't explain why they're never shown alone together, or why the writers decided to make them that way in the first place. Then Diaz comes out as bisexual halfway through season 5. Unlike Holt, she is a sword lesbian who has no problem snogging people on screen. Yet after coming out, her dating life, despite being constantly referenced, remains firmly on screen. It's a full 20 episodes later before one of her female partners makes an appearance and we get the season's first gay kiss. Six seasons in. For a series lauded for its LGBT representation. Of course characters don't have to snog to be valid, but look at the ratio of said snogging. The straight characters get so much focus that they even have sex storylines for comedy. Hell, even Scully gets on-screen action before Holt or Diaz. And by the end of season 5, it's basically the Jake and Amy show, I'm so sorry! The show does explore some specific queer issues, but it doesn't give the character space to exist on even footing with the heterosexual characters. The show has drawn praise simply for allowing queer characters to exist alongside a slew of hetero relationships, marriages and pregnancies. And because queer people are so starved of seeing ourselves represented, we celebrate it, even if it's barely there. In its disdain towards sex workers and deviant lifestyles, in portraying queerness largely in heteronormative terms, in constantly alluding to but never showing queer sexuality, the show quietly reflects the reality of an institution that adheres to patriarchal heterosexual standards, one that punishes exception without mercy. In challenging this, they could only go so far. Part 2. Anti-Blackness The show does have some awareness of its anti-black setting, so they're very careful to make none of the good characters openly racist. They're just a bit xenophobic towards European countries instead. But while the good characters are all very polite about race, actual instances of racism are rarely seen or discussed, which, considering the show's setting, is kinda nuts. You may as well do a show about the history of America and not mention natives, oh way. They do go into it when the show Holt's past, where racism is displayed explicitly. But most of the time, racism is treated kind of as an abstract concept, with the character's primary responsibility being not to make jokes about it. A major exception is the episode Moo Moo. Now, by this point in the show, I had figured that they were going to skirt around seriously exploring racism altogether, so I was really surprised when they did, and even more surprised when they did it well. The premise of the episode is that Terry is stopped by an officer while out searching for his daughter's lost toy. He is then arrested without cause, with unreasonable use of force. Once able to prove he's a police officer, he's released. Before filing a complaint, he decides to try talking to the officer in question. At this point, I was expecting the officer to realise he was being racist and to apologise in a typically oversimplistic turn of events. Instead, the following interaction takes place. The officer apologises for not realising Terry was a cop. When Terry attempts to get him to understand the real issue, the officer justifies his actions on the basis that 9 out of 10 times when he's responding to a call, it's to respond to someone who looks like Terry. He then goes on to say that Terry should have been carrying his badge. 
The conversation shifts to placing the blame on Terry and black people in general for their own arrest, rather than the white officer for his misconduct. This is a much more nuanced and realistic portrayal of events. Similarly hard-hitting is the conversation Terry has with Holt, who initially refuses to take the complaint forward. When the two discuss the situation, he explains that the complaint will negatively impact Terry's career, and that he should therefore drop the issue and focus on rising through the ranks to achieve a position of power that would allow him to make more changes. However, Terry observes that although Holt has already done this, the situation persists. He decides to make the complaint. As a result, he isn't offered a higher ranking position and the episode ends with the two officers drinking to making the racist officer think twice before doing the same thing again. We're left with the misleading impression that filing a complaint would have any impact on the officer's behaviour whatsoever. However, the main takeaway remains that playing the system isn't a good strategy. Injustice must be challenged at source. It's a great start. Or at least it would be if this line of thinking was followed to its logical conclusion that a system designed to oppress a group cannot be fixed by that group's assimilation into that same system. Perhaps fittingly, the subject is never directly approached again. Neither Terry nor Holt are shown to be able to change the system in any meaningful way. Not just in real life, but within the confines of the show itself. Throughout the show, suspects and prisoners are disproportionately more black than white, which certainly reflects reality. But the reasons for higher black rates of certain types of crime are never explored, and other than that one episode, Neither is unfair targeting of black people by police. It's worth noting that this show rarely deals with serious violent crime in a manner that might be upsetting to the viewer. There's the odd historical off-screen murder here and there, while the incredibly common crimes of rape and sexual assault are never even mentioned, aside from that one very special sexual assault episode similar to Moo Moo. The show focuses on drugs and theft, low-level crime primarily associated with black people. There's little to no focus on crimes such as, oh, I don't know, tax evasion, wage theft, worker exploitation, and come to think of it, mass shootings. Again, this mirrors real life. Rich white people can generally do pretty much whatever they want without having to worry about police intervention. And the police suck at dealing with rape and sexual assault. Half the time they're the ones committing those crimes. And the same goes for murder. The overly harsh criminalization of low-level crimes, such as possession of marijuana or cocaine, with its origins in the War on Drugs campaign during the Nixon and Reagan eras, exists to discriminate against black people. In a post-slavery world, it was imperative to arrest as many black people as possible, so that they could continue to be exploited for their free labor. This was the loophole in the 13th Amendment. Immediately after slavery was outlawed, black people were recaptured en masse for the most trivial of offences and sent straight back to work in prison. As time went on and black people started asking for more rights, new excuses were created to arrest them. Rather than helping communities out of desperate conditions resulting from years of slavery, the government criminalised them for it. Today, prisons are lucrative businesses, with private prison firms reaping government investment while cutting as many costs as possible to actually house and care for the inmates there is zero financial incentive for a reform of the incarceration system. In Brooklyn Nine-Nine, corruption is practiced by a few bad apples, not the police as an institution. When Jake ends up wrongly convicted and in prison, it isn't because he's fighting a system that is committed to upholding injustice. It's because one corrupt cop hoodwinked the justice system into thinking he was responsible for her crimes. In reality, she wouldn't need to bother. It's virtually impossible to arrest the police. Who's going to do it? The police? Which leads us on to Jake's experience in prison. While this is mostly played for laughs, he's also shown to be badly treated and to have his basic human rights denied. When he returns from prison, he's deeply disturbed by what he's experienced, and as a result, releases a suspect, believing him to be innocent. For once, he's wrong. Despite this, Holt commends him merely for considering that the suspect might not have committed the crime. This could have been a pivotal moment where the character experienced the reality of the justice system firsthand and realised that he couldn't change it from the inside. But that's obviously not what happened. Next episode we're back to normal and the moral of the story is we need more cops like Jake. This show's biggest failing isn't really any particular thing 
in it. It's the entire false premise. This is a show about friendly, caring, progressive cops, a depiction irresponsibly divorced from a brutal and bloody reality. What next? Louisiana State 5000, the politically correct prison comedy? A fluffy cat and mouse relationship between a death row inmate and an electric chair operator? Some argue that the show is an optimistic representation of how the police force could be. But without acknowledging how something is now, you can't envision how it might be better. Because they've tried to reform the police force. They've tried many of the same methods depicted in the show. And they don't work. Black faces in high places is a failed ideology. Cops of colour, god that feels weird to say, have been shown time and time again to act pretty much the same as white ones, sometimes worse. Black and white representation in the police force reflects that of the overall population, meaning that the police force is overwhelmingly white. There is no higher percentage of black cops assigned to black areas, meaning the overall style of policing can't change. And as we discussed earlier, the types of crimes focused on, such as drugs and sex work, disproportionately affect people of colour, even if the cop is doing their job perfectly without bias. Which pretty much doesn't happen. Training measures with the aim of helping officers to identify and cater for their own unconscious bias haven't really been shown to work. They're generally treated by the participants as a light-hearted exercise that doesn't reflect, or affect, reality. Obama, arguably the highest place blackface, tried to make the police force better through training reforms and it just didn't happen. They sank money into the police force in the 60s with much the same idea and simply ended up handing them more power. When I understood the basic premise of Hamilton and saw how positively people were responding to it, I thought, this is propaganda. This is taking a violent, shameful institution and repackaging it so that people can feel good about it. And much as I enjoy it, Brooklyn Nine-Nine does exactly the same thing. It reimagines a brutal and violent institution as a moral force for good. It mostly follows the bad apples narrative, and when it does acknowledge that structural issues exist, it suggests that good cops will change the system from the inside, without ever really showing how. And no wonder, because they can't. How do you fix a system that isn't broken? The modern police force perpetuates and maintains a racist status quo and that is exactly what it was intended to do. I don't think people watch this show for its political ideology, it's a comedy and it does comedy good. But it's important to engage with media critically and to consider how it might affect those who don't. Especially when it comes to police, because the idea that they protect people comes from television. There's some really good stuff in this show. The relationships between the characters feel meaningful and real, the broader messages are great, and the constant sprinkling of progressive ideas might just normalise them to people who are expecting and enjoy traditional cop shows. But when your protagonists are the pigs, there's only so much good your show can do. And that can't change unless those protagonists quit and join the fight for something better. And that would be a really good show. Special thanks to my monthly coffee supporters, Comrade Jean-Michel, Danny Cron, Diletto, Isaac D.F., Evalshin, Jake, JL1234, Jeff Ayette, Kaylee, Meru Azur, Miasal, Nerdy, Phil Nadeau, Rowan Thomas, Sanzat, Tayan, TX Watson, Yasarian on a Tree, Zoe Phoenix, and Zotto Zahn. If you would like to help me make more videos, please consider becoming a monthly supporter over on my coffee. If you want to follow me on other places, these are the ways you can do that. If you would like to know more about abolishing the police and what we could have instead, I've linked some resources in the description, along with more things you can do to help the Black Lives Matter movement.